Good evening. My name is Maddie Chubb, and I am a social work major here at Bethel. I want to begin our time together this evening by reminding ourselves of whose land we are on. We are coming together today on the traditional lands of the Wichita Kaw and Osage, the original stewards of the land that Bethel College and Kip Corps now inhabit. While I am not an indigenous person myself, I want to honor and respect the people who originally inhabited this place. I also want to recognize the cultural wisdom and practices that were stolen. This land was stolen from Native Americans through colonization and broken promises made by the government. Here at Bethel and Kip Corps, we stand in solidarity with indigenous people and their liberation and offer our full support to help them thrive in society. Helping people thrive can include donating time and money to indigenous-led organizations, amplifying the voices of indigenous people leading grassroots movements, and returning land. Now I'll pass it to Denzel. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'll be doing the introduction for Ms. Christina Swarns. First and foremost, we are honored to have you here with us this evening. Being one of the few black women to have argued a case before the Supreme Court, along with others such as Constance Baker Motley, Verna Williams, Leandra Kruger, the impact within the justice system that you are making as a black woman in America is absolutely incredible and admirable. Here at Bethel, our community strives to do the same thing. We have many different fields of study, different athletic abilities, artistic backgrounds, and other extracurricular activities. Each and every one of us has the opportunity to leave our mark on this world in a positive way. Hearing from you tonight will give us even more of inspiration to do so. As we prepare for the real world and for those who are already in it, we come here this evening to listen with an open mind and an open heart. Now, I will introduce President John Guerin to the stage. Good evening, folks. Welcome to Bethel College, Historic Memorial Hall, and the annual Peace Lecture. Thank you, Josue, Maddie, and Denzel for the music, land acknowledgement, and student welcome. I'm looking forward to the upcoming musical selections by the Bethel College Concert Choir and Michelle Armster and Rob Simon. Christina, I'm eagerly anticipating your presentation on justice and democracy. Welcome to, again to campus. I'm glad you've chosen to join us on this special occasion. Tonight's lecture represents one of those round number milestone anniversaries, the 50th, for the Peace Lecture Series here at Bethel College. We should take time to reflect on how we have arrived at this moment. After all, 50 years of continuity in anything is remarkable. But I've been thinking about the preconditions that made tonight possible. The first precondition is that the college has to be around long enough and operate uninterrupted for the event to take place consistency. Bethel is in its 136th year and over that time has suspended or altered course delivery, delivery only three times once during the global coronavirus pandemic in the spring semester of 2020, and two times during the global influenza pandemic in December 1918 and March 1919. So we've been here as a platform for the Peace Lecture series. Second, and more importantly, the topic must mean something to the institution. That is to say that peace must prevail among all the other meaningful and urgent topics across these last five decades. Think of that for a moment. The list of topics is not trivial. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression, technology, rights and privileges of research, and the practice of teaching and learning are foundational 
to the working of any college. Yet peace prevailed as a theme and has been sustained for 50 years. Third, there must be a steady stream of funding, a community of financial supporters to bring a speaker and people together. The donors and sponsors for this weekend's events are listed on the back of your program, but they're only a sampling of the people and funds that have provided support for this speaker series during the last 50 years. Let's thank them, shall we? Fourth, the event must attract noteworthy speakers. This speaker series has featured two recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize, Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement, MacArthur Genius Award winner Vivian Paley, Cheyenne Pe Peace Chief Lawrence Hart, numerous anti-war and peace activists, Deputy Director of Amnesty International Kurt Gehring, a Bethel graduate, Mark McCormick, who joins us this evening, and numerous academic researchers and writers. Tonight's edition of the Director of the Innocence Project will only continue to enhance that already impressive list. Even with all those preconditions met, the question that presents itself is why we're here tonight celebrating the 50th anniversary rather than the 60th or 75th. The answer lies at the intersection of societal change and the wisdom of a handful of Bethel College professors. Four significant and anguishing events set the stage for the start of the Peace Lecture Series. The scars of the Vietnam War that went on from 1955 to 1975, its brutal, brutal bombings, the killing, and of course the involvement uh, of the American military. The memory of the Cuban Missile Crisis figures prominently in the memory uh, and in the prompting of the, the Peace Lecture Series. That happened in October 1962, and it was a symbol of the ever-present threat of nuclear war. The Watts Riots in Los Angeles in August of 1865, designed to end police mistreatment and various forms of discrimination. And finally, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. The collective anguish and violence of those events prompted Duane Friesen, professor of Bible and religion at Bethel College, and I quote here, to emphasize Bethel's educational mission in peacemaking and conflict resolution, close quote, and put it in the school's academic catalog. Following examples of peace institutes and peace studies from other colleges, and supported by Bethel's spirit of experimentation, a new president, and federal grant money, Professor Friesen began to envision a peace lecture series and a peace studies program for the college. He had a moral conscience for the moment that our country was experiencing. His colleagues in this endeavor included William Keeney, Robert Mayer, Mayer Dwight Platt, Arnold Weedle, and Harold Moyer. Those of you familiar with Bethel will recognize many of those names. The group covered a broad range of academic disciplines and scheduled in spring 1973 a series of lectures and speakers under the series title, Human Conflict and the Quest for Peace. The phenomenon of peace and its role in shaping a better world was the emphasis then as it is today. Duane, if you would stand so we can thank you for your uh, vision 50 years ago that led us here today, uh, I would appreciate it. Some of the information I just shared with you came from Professor Friesen's uh, 25th anniversary uh, lecture um, that he gave about 25 years ago this month. <laughs> it was a wonderful reading. <laughs> the speaker series has been offered continually since 1973 under the conditions I described earlier in this talk. But beginning with the 19... 18, sorry, 1987-1988 academic year, the Peace Lecture Series became a program of the Kansas, Kansas Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, 
or KIPCOR. The college and the community are grateful their, for their faithful and reliable continuation of this program, including tonight's 50th anniversary celebration. Gary Flory and his role as, as a previous executive director. Gary, are you here? I thought I saw you. Did you raise your hand? Yes? Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Gary Flory shepherded the, uh, this uh, program along. And now, uh, in her final uh, year as executive director of, the, of KIPP Corps, Cheryl Wilson uh, has provided uh, support and helped arrange uh, the, uh, the program. So thank you, Cheryl and Gary. Cheryl will introduce Christina Swarns following the Bethel College Concert Choir's performance of I Dream a World. The concert choir is accompanied on piano by Philip Balzer, senior student at Bethel College. Thank you again for being here, and please enjoy tonight's activities.
Thank you so much, Dr. Waters and Bethel Choir. It was always a pleasure to follow that. I am Cheryl Wilson. I am the Executive Director of the Kansas Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, KIPCOR. I am so grateful that you took time out of your evening on a Friday night to come and join us for this 50th anniversary of the Peace Lecture Series. I realize that for a long time we've held that information about Christina on our website and many of you have read her bio and I do not intend to read it in full but I want to highlight some of her accomplishments and then I want to tell you a little bit about how we know each other. So currently she is in her fourth year as the, ex as the executive director of Innocence Project. But before that, she previously served as the president and attorney in charge of the Office of the Appellate Defender, OAD, one of New York City's oldest providers of indigent appellate defense representation. Prior to that, it, she, she served as the director for the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Um, she, she oversaw a lot of the work that set her up to come into the work that she's currently doing. We know that she is a graduate of Howard University, where she received her bachelor's, and then she also earned her JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. So those are the highlights. There's, there's many more. One of the, th one of the things that um, I did when I came here is I started to think through, I, I'd heard about this Peace Lecture Series. When I came here in 2017, Leonard Pitts had just done his Peace Lecture and that was all anybody could talk about. And it was a really special occasion from what I could understand and I've gotten to know Mr. Pitts over the years and he even came back and did a virtual peace lecture with us during COVID. I knew that I wanted to bring someone here spectacular who would speak into this moment when we talked about a 50th anniversary of this lecture series. And I know exactly who I wanted and Christina has not disappointed in her time since she's been on campus with our students and meeting some of the folks that are in this room. She has been gracious and kind and humble and someone who is as down to earth with all of her accomplishments and, and we've had just such great time reconnecting in person. Now I'm gonna tell you something funny. Christina and I have not had more than less than 24 hours together in person over the over decade time that I've known her. But we have truly become friends. When um, I was back in one of my many cities that I lived in, um, I was living in Montgomery, Alabama at the time when um, I was doing work where I worked on capital cases to connect families who were, um, uh, had probably lost someone um, and um, due to the heinous circumstances that would create um, someone receiving the death penalty. And so the families on the opposite side of that harm often do not have all of the access that they need for their own reasons of healing. And it had been something that had been broken in the system for a long time. And one of the things that I consider to be an honor and a privilege that I don't talk about much about doing it um, has been one of the real true honors of my life. It's been walking with these families to get answers to questions that only maybe the person who's committed the harm can offer and sometimes working with defense attorneys when they have um, probably been named as the enemy 
in on the other side of these cases. I've given them access to these teams. And Christina um, was one of the defense attorneys I got the privilege and honor to work for in those years. And in that time of working on that case, I could just sense the ways that she felt such um, concern for the family, for the families that the defendant had harmed. And when you, some of you have work that you do with attorneys, and you can sense those who are sincere and really get it. And she is one of those people. And, and, you know, for what it was worth, I worked with some people who didn't really get it, and I wouldn't work with them again. But she was somebody that whenever she called, I picked up. I took her call. And so when I heard that, um, you know, this case that we had worked on in all of these different ways, um, and I felt like I had a really small, small piece in this case, but when I heard that this was a case that she had actually taken to the Submarine Court and won, I felt like, who am I to know someone who makes that type of history? Who am I? I felt so honored to know her and to continue in relationship and to be known as somebody that she would take my call. Christina is um, someone I've said to my students. She might have a name that you have never heard of before. She might be somebody you don't know, but you should. And I truly believe as time goes forward, her name will be in the annals of history as someone who really fought for the good for a lot of people and a lot of people who don't get named. She's in the trenches and she's somebody that I'd want on my team if I was fighting for my life. So with all of that, I could, I could continue to, to wax and wane on all of her accomplishments, but I am excited that she has chosen to spend her weekend with us and tell us more about the incredible work that she's doing. And so without further ado, I give you Christina Swans. Please give her your best Bethel welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, and thank you. Oops. I just got loud. Um, I want to thank Joe Sway and Maddie and Denzel and Dr. Gehring and the choir um, and everyone who I've met so far today. This is my first time in Kansas. And I have to say, I've been, um, it's been an amazingly warm welcome. And I want to thank you so much for welcoming me here today. I will also separately um, just thank Cheryl, who has told you a little of our story. Um, and I'll tell you more about the case um, in my remarks. But um, there is something special about someone who will answer the call of a lawyer who says, um, I, my client might be executed and I need your help. You know, there's something special about people who um, run into the harm and not away from the harm. Um, and Cheryl did that. So there was every reason for her to say no when we called, when I called. We were in a crisis. Um, you know, we were, we were 
by its nature. The case I was working on is, was literally the height of conflict and pain and trauma on all sides. And what I did was invite her to, to join me in the midst of this mess. Um, and not just to join me, but to try to find a path between two uh, very uh, diametrically opposed sides at that time. Um, it wasn't an easy ask, right? People were in extraordinary pain, uh, but she stepped in with grace and with um, extraordinary wisdom, and she built, to the best of our abilities, right, a bridge between us and the families, the truly um, extraordinary families that were impacted by this crime. We never became best friends with the families, obviously, that, that would be too much to ask, but what we did achieve was a modicum of peace, I think. They understood that we didn't hate them, that we didn't wish them ill, we didn't dismiss or diminish the pain that they experienced. We acknowledged and recognized it. We wanted to share the remorse that our client truly felt. We wanted them to understand that. Um, and we wanted them to know that we were available, period. And I think we accomplished that goal um, because through six years of litigation, as you might imagine, often in these cases, there's a lot of media attention and people speak out and they speak in favor of executions. And in this case, that simply didn't happen. We achieved enough peace that a family could feel that they could go on um, and not need to have an execution to feel like they had received accountability or recognition for their pain. Um, and that's an extraordinary accomplishment that Cheryl helped us achieve, and so I am forever grateful to her for that. All right, so the case. As you heard, I uh, represented, a, I litigated a case in the United States Supreme Court. My client's name uh, is, was Dwayne Buck. So Mr. Buck was condemned to death in Texas after his own attorney uh, presented an expert that told the sentencing jury that he, Mr. Buck, was more likely to commit criminal acts of violence in the future because he is black, period. In Texas, a finding of future dangerousness is a prerequisite for a death sentence. And in this case, the prosecution didn't have any other evidence to prove Mr. Buck's future dangerousness, so the jury relied on the defense expert's testimony. And so Dwayne Buck was sentenced to death because he was black. As you might imagine, I argued to the Supreme Court that our Constitution and the rule of law doesn't permit an execution based on an immutable characteristic like race. And Chief Justice Roberts wrote, writing on behalf of a 6-2 majority of the court, Justice Scalia had passed and Justice Gorsuch had not yet been confirmed, so I argued to eight. Uh, the, the majority agreed and they declared that Mr. Buck's death sentence was unconstitutional. Justice Roberts wrote, and I'm quoting him, our criminal law punishes people for what they do, not who they are, close quote. He went on to explain that, quoting him again, when a jury hears expert testimony that expressly makes a defendant's race directly pertinent on the question of life or death, the impact of that evidence cannot be measured simply by how much airtime it receives at trial or how many pages it occupies in the record. Some toxins can be deadly in small doses." Close quote. While this decision, which is called Buck versus Davis, is rightly celebrated for the sweeping language that the court used to denounce the use of racist stereotypes in this capital case. It's important to take a moment to reflect on how we got to that decision and what that history says about our system of justice. Even though the expert testimony was patently false and racist and unconstitutional and apparent on the cold face of the record, 
Mr. Buck spent 20 years on death row. Indeed, the United States Supreme Court is the only court that ever ruled in his favor. Before I entered the case with my colleagues at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the Texas Defender Service in 2011, Mr. Buck spent 14 years unsuccessfully appealing his death sentence and conviction. Between 2011 and 2017, my colleagues and I presented appeals on his behalf to the trial court, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas, and the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Each of those courts was prepared to allow Mr. Buck to go to his death based on a record that Justice Roberts said, quoting him again, supported making a decision on life or death on the basis of race. So put in that context, Dwayne Buck's case has to be understood as both an extraordinary victory and a profound failure. And in that regard, Mr. Buck's case is sadly not except, ex exceptional. The truth is that every day, people go before our nation's courts with compelling and meritorious claims of innocence and injustice that are never heard or acknowledged. Since 1992, the Innocence Project has freed or exonerated 250 people. In those cases, all of their appeals were denied before we assumed representation, which is how we get to the topic of my talk. Justice delayed is democracy denied. As we enter this election year, I find myself reflecting on the meaning and the promise of democracy. Top of mind issues include voting rights, free and fair elections, candidate integrity, and the freedom of the press. But so too must be criminal legal system reform. That's because the rule of law is a hallmark of a healthy democracy. But what does that really mean, right? What is the rule of law? It's the fundamental principle that no one is above the law, that everyone is treated equally under the law, that all of us are held accountable to the same laws, that there are clear and fair processes for enforcing the law, that there is an independent judiciary, and that human rights are guaranteed for all. As you might imagine, the Dwayne Buck case left me thinking a lot about democracy, the rule of law, and the elected and appointed judges who turned a blind eye to the overt racism in his case. So this election year, when so much is at stake, I urge you to remember that the manner in which our criminal legal system is administered is a critical measure of our own commitment to fundamental democratic values. Criminal legal system reform must be a ballot issue. I now have the privilege of serving as the executive director of the Innocence Project. Our mission is to free the innocent, prevent wrongful convictions, and create fair, compassionate, and equitable systems of justice for everyone. Our work is guided by science and grounded in anti-racism. Every day, we work incredibly hard to increase access to justice. Just last year, the Innocence Project, relying on the courts and, in some cases, partnering with elected prosecutors from across the political spectrum, secured the freedom or exoneration of nine people. We also partnered with our Innocence Network colleagues to pass more than 10 critical reforms in state legislatures. And we're not alone. In recent years, we've seen an inspiring array of bipartisan movements and practices that promote integrity in the criminal legal system and buttress our democracy. But we're also students of history, and we know that in this country, periods of reform are all too often followed by periods of retrenchment. We have therefore been disheartened, but not surprised, to see fundamentally anti-democratic efforts including arbitrary, unilateral, 
decision-making by judges and governors that reduce transparency, fairness, and the participatory nature of our criminal legal system processes. So today, I will talk a little bit about, I think I was supposed to do this first, okay, there we go. Uh, not yet, all right. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about the successes and the challenges as a reminder to us that our electoral decisions this year and every year must be informed by a meaningful understanding of, the political, of our political candidates' positions on criminal legal system reform and supported by a demonstrated commitment to upholding the rule of law in our criminal courts. Think back to your happiest memories. Your wedding day and graduation. The everyday moments you'll never forget. Some people miss these moments. The day your baby took their first steps. I was forced to miss watching my son growing up into the man that he's become. You know, God willing, I'm hoping that I'm around for my grandson. The day they were born. You and I play like down, you know, you didn't do nothing wrong, and, and you have to give birth with him cups and chocolates in your feet. They hardly let me touch him. I was begging the nurse. I told her, I don't know when I'm going to touch him again. For so many, these memories are tainted. The only photo that I had from my childhood was the one being let out of the prison. I was robbed of a normal life. It was a tragedy that Mr. Burton spent some 20 years in jail for a crime that he did not commit. I offer my apologies on behalf of a system that failed me. One of their happiest moments is the day they were released from prison. 19 years! Okay, so I'm going to start with the successes, the good news. So I graduated from law school in 1993, one year after the Innocence Project opened its doors. My first job was as a public defender in Manhattan, and at that time, the broad consensus was that we had the finest criminal justice system in the world, and that anyone who was arrested by the police was surely guilty of something. Over the next 31 years, the world changed. Almost 3,500 people have now been exonerated in this country. And emotional scenes of innocent people emerging from courthouse doors and prison gates were suddenly everywhere. The reality that innocent people spent decades in prison took our collective breath away. Suddenly, Jurors worried about convicting innocent people. Prosecutors worried about sending an innocent person to prison. This understanding of the weaknesses in our criminal legal system and the weaknesses in our adherence to the rule of law was exacerbated by such other factors and circumstances that emerged as videos of police killings of black men Studies documenting the shortcomings in the administration of criminal justice, including the National Registry of Exonerations reports that show that 
Black people are seven times more likely than white people to be falsely convicted of serious crimes. Innocent black people were nearly eight times more likely than innocent white people to be falsely convicted of rape. Innocent black people were 19 times more likely to be convicted of drug crimes than innocent white people, even though there is no meaningful disparity between the rate at which black and white people sell or possess drugs. The exonerations of innocent black people convicted of murder were almost 50% more likely to include misconduct by police officers than the exonerations of white people convicted of murder. An undeniable public mandate for accountability emerged and prosecutors, legislators, courts, and executives responded. For the first time in American history, prosecutor offices began to take responsibility for correcting criminal legal system injustices by creating conviction integrity units, teams of prosecutors that work to uncover and correct the miscarriages of justices that occurred within their own offices. These specialized teams of prosecutors have produced more than 700 exonerations since 1989. For example, the Innocence Project partnered with the Manhattan DA's office to jointly reinvestigate the convictions of Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Islam, two men who spent a combined 42 years in prison after being wrongly convicted of the assassination of Malcolm X in 1966. The joint reinvestigation we conducted revealed that at the time of the trial, both the FBI and the NYPD, the New York Police Department, possessed evidence that confirmed and corroborated a third man's claim that he, working with two entirely different people, had committed the murder. That evidence was never turned over to the defense at or after trial. Mr. Aziz and Mr. Islam, who had passed away by the time of the exoneration, and they were exonerated in 2022. Similarly, just last fall, the, the Innocence Project worked with the Westchester County, New York, District Attorney's Conviction Review Unit to exonerate Leonard Mack, who was wrongly convicted of a 1976 rape he did not commit. Mr. Mack's wrongful conviction was textbook. It involved many of the leading causes of wrongful conviction, including eyewitness misidentification, coercive police tactics, tunnel vision, misapplied forensics, and racial bias. One of the survivors that identified Mr. Mack had a sight impairment, and Mr. Mack was arrested for driving while black in a white neighborhood. Because conviction integrity units can be key partners in upholding the rule of law and restoring justice, we should hold district attorney candidates accountable to creating and maintaining them. That means the DA has to properly staff and appropriately resource the conviction review unit. They have to partner with the defense to conduct rigorous and honest reviews of prior convictions. They should conduct root cause analyses of wrongful convictions and implement structural changes to prevent future tragedies. But the progress in the criminal legal system reform does not just come, has not just come from prosecutors. State legislators have also taken action to prevent future injustices. Well-publicized exonerations of people who were wrongfully convicted as children raise public awareness about the fact that kids are uniquely susceptible to false, to false confession. The most famous example, of course, is that of the exonerated five. As teenagers, Youssef Salam, Raymond Santana, Antron McRae, Kevin Richardson, and Corey Wise were wrongly convicted of the rape and brutal beating of a white woman in Central Park after being coerced by the police into falsely confessing to the crime. But they are hardly alone. Innocence Project client Hugh Burton was just 17 years old when he falsely confessed to the murder of his own mother in the Bronx, New York. The police interrogated a sleep-deprived and traumatized teenager who found his mother dead when he came home from school. Hugh had no criminal record. He was denied access to his father. 
He was threatened by the police. He was promised leniency if he confessed. Hugh spent 19 years in prison before he was released on parole. He was exonerated 10 years later. Because false confession is a leading cause of wrongful conviction, and because children are uniquely susceptible to false confession, cases like these and many others have, been, have driven a demand for change. And states like Illinois, Oregon, Utah, and California have responded by banning the police practice of using de deception in the interrogation of children. And I'll just take a pause to make sure that you are aware that currently in all 50 of the United States, police can and do use deception in the interrogation of adults. That means if you are questioned by a police officer, they are fully authorized to lie to you to get you to confess. These new laws prohibit the use of deception by police when questioning children. This kind of law, this kind of law change is critically important because it prevents wrongful convictions from happening in the first place. And as Martin Luther King Jr. said while standing, as I understand it, at this very podium, while the law may not change the hearts of men, the law can change the habits of men if it is vigorously enforced. Courts and governors have also sometimes stepped in to prevent the execution of innocent people. Almost three years ago, then Governor Ralph Northam abolished the death penalty in Virginia, becoming the first southern state to do so. Explaining his decision, Governor Northam said, we can't give out the ultimate punishment without being 100% sure that we're right. And we can't sentence people to that ultimate punishment knowing the system doesn't work the same for everyone. Public pressure and growing awareness of the fact that 196 people who were sentenced to death were subsequently exonerated has contributed to stays of execution and commutations of sentences for Innocence Project clients like Purvis Payne in Tennessee, Julius Jones in Oklahoma, and Melissa Lucio in Texas. Melissa was convicted of the murder of her own two-year-old daughter and sentenced to death in Texas. Our investigation of her case revealed that the child's death was an accident and not a crime. Melissa came within two days of execution before the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals issued a stay. You haven't heard the news yet? No, what happened? The Court of Criminal Appeals issued a stay of your execution for Wednesday. Our work for Melissa continues. While we have celebrated these successes, we have also seen the pendulum swing backwards. And we are reminded always that elections have consequences. In Missouri, the life of Marcellus Williams, a current client of the Innocence Project, the Midwest Innocence Project, the Federal Defender of the Western District of Missouri and private counsel, now hangs in the balance. Mr. Williams spent the last 42, 24 years on death row. No physical evidence connects him to the crime scene. His murder conviction is based on the testimony of two incentivized witnesses, meaning people who were compensated for their testimony. And in 2016, DNA samples taken from a murder weapon excluded Mr. Williams as the contributor. One year later, then Missouri Governor Eric Greitens 
created a board of inquiry to investigate Mr. Williams' case, including all of the credible evidence of his innocence. But just last year, Governor Mike Parson arbitrarily and without explanation dissolved the board of inquiry before it could produce a report and recommendation. In so doing, Governor Parson lifted Mr. Williams' stay of execution and paved the way for Attorney General Andrew Bailey to ask the Missouri Supreme Court to schedule an execution date. Thankfully, the St. Louis County Prosecuting Attorney's Office opposed that request and, after reviewing the evidence in Mr. Williams' case, filed a motion asking the St. Louis County Circuit Court to overturn his conviction. We are actively fighting for Mr. Williams' life. Additionally, in Louisiana, Innocence Project client Jimmy Chris Dumpkin was one of 56 people on death row to petition the Board of Pardons and Committee on Parole for clemency. Mr. Duncan was convicted of murder in 1994 and condemned to death after discredited pathologist Stephen Hain and dentist Michael West offered expert testimony based on debunked science that connected Mr. Duncan to the murder of a child in his care. Specifically, Mr. Duncan was connected to this crime by so-called bite mark evidence. Such evidence has been wholly discredited as having zero scientific basis. At the urging of Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards, the board agreed to conduct clemency hearings to review petitions for relief filed by people on death row, including Mr. Duncan. But the Attorney General and Governor-elect Jeff Landry, a starch, staunch advocate for the death penalty, partnered with a coalition of Louisiana district attorneys and they filed a lawsuit against the board to prevent the clemency review. Governor Landry and the board settled the lawsuit with the board opting to hold limited administrative reviews for only a small number of applicants. Faced with an abbreviated process that offered only to a handful of people on death row, none of whom were ultimately granted clemency, Mr. Duncan chose to withdraw his petition. And lastly, for many years, judges in our country were allowed to override sentencing decisions in death penalty cases. For example, in Florida, Innocence Project Robert Du Bois was convicted of murder and sentenced to death by a judge, even though his jury unanimously sent recommended a life sentence. He was ultimately exonerated after spending 37 years in prison, including four on death row, after the Innocence Project, the Innocence Project of Florida, and the Conviction Review Unit at the Office of the State Attorney for the 13th Judicial Circuit conducted a joint reinvestigation that not only established that Mr. Dubois was innocent, but also identified the actual perpetrator. Although judicial overrides were declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court, numerous people sentenced to death by judicial override remain on death row in Alabama. One such person was Kenneth Smith who, in January, became the first human being in the world to be executed by nitrogen hypoxia. Each of these cases exemplify the ways in which unilateral decisions by individual actors in the criminal legal system can undermine democracy. True democracy requires fairness and accountability in the criminal legal system. Government overreach, police and prosecutorial misconduct, Inadequate defense and racial bias undermine the rule of law and play a significant role in wrongful convictions. Candidates for elective office must make, clear and make a clear and unequivocal commitment to the rule of law, or these issues will continue to undermine the integrity of the system and indeed our democracy. That's my slide, so let me keep this going. What was going on through your mind as you were being arrested and charged with murder? Fear, disbelief, shock. But at the same time, I was optimistic because I just believed that if you're innocent, then there were people who were going to do the right thing and be able to figure it out. And so I believed without a doubt that everything would get worked out. Yeah, it got
got worked out, but man, it just took a long time. It's a blessing to see you again. Being in prison for 15 years as an innocent man, did you ever give up? No, I never gave up. I knew I was innocent. And I was never raised to give up. We were raised to fight. We grew up fighting and persevering and overcoming. And most of all, we were taught faith. My faith is the number one thing that brought me through that ordeal. There was many days that I thought about committing suicide. I was this close from saying, you know, well, what's the use? If I have to live the rest of my life in a place like this for something that I don't know anything about, I'd rather be dead. But they say that adversity can bring out the best in you. I refuse to give up. And it just strengthened my faith and made me fight harder a lot had changed in the world. While you were locked up, how have you been adjusting? I haven't. <laughs> I'm still unable to adjust. Prison changed me to where I have nothing in common with anybody. I felt like I was on a whole different planet for 20 years. But I still believe that there are people who care and who want to make a difference. That's why I'm here right now. We have a serious epidemic of people's lives being destroyed because of wrongful convictions. Everybody that loved me, they suffered right along with me. So it wasn't just my life, it was their lives as well. With any epidemic, you fight for a cure, and that's my purpose. Once people understand how devastating this is, then I think it will move people to action, to want to do something to prevent this type of thing from happening to human beings. It was John Lewis that powerfully reminded us that democracy is not a state, it is an act, and each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community, a nation and world society at peace with itself. That admonition is particularly salient this and every election year. So again, I urge you to remember this year as you think about democracy and elections that justice delayed is democracy denied. Thank you. At our lectures, we always have a time for questions and answers. So this is no different, although we are gonna do it a little differently tonight. We have index cards for anyone who has a question, and if you will raise your hand, we have folks who will bring you a card, and she will be able to, they will be able to collect those and we will ask the question. Right now, I'm gonna call up our academic dean, Dr. Bob Milliman, for a response.
Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, please. Thank you, Christina, for your inspiring and convicting address. You have provided us with a clear and compelling presentation on the importance of selecting political leaders committed to justice and to reform of the criminal legal system. The cost of neglecting this call is tragic, both on the personal and societal levels. The personal level leads, involves the wrongful conviction of innocent people, especially innocent black people, resulting in tragic periods of wrongful incarceration, even the horrible, unthinkable, yet actual occurrence of the execution of innocent people. The societal tragedy is what the toleration of this wrong says about us as a people. We are complacent, uncaring, especially about the structural unfairness and inequity that produces untold harm to individuals and to our national psyche. Therefore, I applaud Christina's amazing work at the Innocence Project, and I heartily endorse her call to action tonight to respond now and in the future. It is my contention that heeding Christina's call to action is a natural, ex ex natural extension of who we are at Bethel College. Our mission is to prepare students for meaningful lives of work and service through faith formation, the liberal arts and practical experience and career pathways. The aim of this mission is to graduate students who increase human flourishing or shalom the word that encompasses all that peace is. Human flourishing in society by first of all owning and enacting their faith and demonstrating compassion for the powerless. This vision brings to mind one of our values, peace and justice that seeks fair and equitable treatment for all members of society. And there is no one more powerless to satisfy their pursuit of fair an equitable treatment than someone who must endure a legal system that is structurally set against them. But I also believe that one of the stated means to achieving our mission, engaging in faith formation, through one of the stated hopes of our vision, owning and acting one's faith, will result in demonstrating compassion for those people without power when they are faced with the desperate prospect of unjust conviction and punishment, even execution. Now many, if not most people in this room, trace their faith to Abraham, the ancestor of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Abraham, we read, was chosen by God to charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. That's it. Righteousness and justice. But that is it. If you count yourself a child of Abraham, that is your call. Do the right thing, as we heard in the film. Do the right thing and promote justice today, tomorrow, and even into the future. Furthermore, we can take our lead in that activity from a well-known child of Abraham, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was a controversial figure in his day. For example, in fulfillment of his calling, he rebuked leaders for neglecting justice. One occasion of neglect shown by those leaders was particularly striking. In this situation, the societal, societal leaders wanted Jesus to join them in approving of their decision to execute a powerless, marginalized woman who had been convicted of a capital crime under their law. The means of execution dictated by that law was by stoning. Jesus replied to their invitation with his own invitation. 
Let anyone among you who is without fault be the first to throw a stone at her. Cut to the heart by these razor-sharp words, all those who condemn the woman departed, and the woman went away free. In a startling turn of events, Jesus took the courageous, unpopular position. He defended the woman, stood for justice, spoke out against capital punishment, and for human dignity with real, positive results. Taking a stand worked. Taking a stand today works. Christina has taken a stand. She proves it, that it works. Can we turn the world upside down like Jesus, like Christina? Can we oppose the death penalty and injustice, even at personal risk? After all, Jesus was eventually executed with the aid of those same leaders he opposed. Can we seek to bring peace and justice to our land and thereby promote the vision of human flourishing by doing righteousness, by doing the right thing, and by doing justice? Christina, thank you for your clarity on the need to act and for your clarity on the action to take. In the midst of politicians' bland, opaque, and base appeals to our darker inclinations, you have called us to a more enlightened path. May your words not fall on our deaf ears or our paralyzed wills. Instead, may we embrace democracy by hastening to ensure justice in our nation, our state, our county, and our neighborhoods. Thank you, Bob. So we got some questions, and I'm going to ask the first one. So, Christina, what inspired you to do this work? Oh, oh, there it goes. Okay. I like this question because I like to tell um, students um, that I speak to that I would never have hired myself um, <laughs> because I was, um, I was definitely a kid that did not know what they wanted to do. I s wanted to be a hairstylist for a long time. I wanted to be an archaeologist for a long time. My parents then said, no, you actually have to find a job that pays you something so you can, you know, live outside of our home at some point. Um, and so what happened was, I, I watched The Verdict. Do, mm -hmm. do, do you all remember the film The Verdict? Mm -hmm. And I watched this film and I was like, huh, well, that's interesting. I don't have, I didn't have lawyers in my family, so I didn't really think, I don't think I had a conception of what a lawyer might do. So I watched this film, The Verdict, and I was like, and just landed. It was like, oh, right, I'm going to do that. And so my parents um, were like, yes, that, this is a better path. Um, <laughs> and so they were like, okay, let me introduce you to some people you should be familiar with. Like, you should know about Thurgood Marshall. You should know about Constance Baker Motley. You should know about these people. And so I was like, great, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, so I went to the college, I went to law school. When I got to law school, I still, again, I did not have lawyers in my family, so the lawyers in the room will appreciate these comments, the rest of you will not. But when I got to law school, I didn't know what law review was. Oh. I did not understand why people would clerk for a judge instead of getting a real job. <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, I'm very confused. So I spent three years continuing in my sort of wandering in the wilderness. I really did not know what I wanted to do. And then truthfully, <laughs> what happened, this is the truthful answer is, at the third year of law school, I was so confused, I stopped interviewing for jobs because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I said, I'm gonna take the bar, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna figure it out. So my long-suffering parents said, as I returned home with a degree from Penn Law School, um, 
this is nice, um, but you need to go and find something to do with yourself. And so the only thing I could think of to do, going back to where I started, was I literally picked up the phone and I cold called the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Wow. And I just said, listen, like I'm not stupid, I had good grades. I was like, I'm not stupid, I'm not sure what I wanna do, I would like to do what you do, I think. So how about I just come and volunteer there for a while? And so Elaine Jones, who was then the director counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, must have been having an extremely slow week <laughs> because she's, she met with me. I remember this. I, was this. I now realize how crazy this is. As the executive director of a organization, I would not meet with me. Um, but she met with me in the big conference room. And as, we now, as Elaine and I like now to say, uh, for reasons of history, right, she said, sure, OK. You can come and volunteer for us. And then she said, so where do you want to go? We have voting rights, we have economic justice, we have education, and we have capital punishment. And I said, I don't care. Like, I'll go anywhere. And she sent me to the 17th floor to the capital punishment project. When I arrived on the 17th floor, they were under warrant uh, on a case in Arkansas. The client's name was Barry Lee Fairchild. He was intellectually disabled. He had been picked up in a sweep of every black man in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Hmm. He was beaten, you could see hmm. on his face, after um, the police interrogation, and he gave a false confession and was sent to death row. And so for the very first time, when I got to 17 and I started working, that magical light bulb went off, and I was like, oh, this is what I was supposed to do. Um, and that was, that was it. And from that point forward, I became a trial public defender for two years. Well, there's more to the story. So I volunteered, I was all excited. I was like, Elaine Jones, you should hire me. She said, ha 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 ha, no. Um, <laughs> because you have no useful skills because you've done nothing to prepare you for this moment, which is true. Um, so they said, go learn, go learn. You have to go figure this out. You have to learn how to be a criminal lawyer. They said, go be a public defender. So I listened. Again, I'm not stupid, I follow instructions. Um, and so I went and I was a public defender, a trial public defender, then I, they, told, they told me, my colleagues at LDF, about a job doing death penalty work in Philadelphia where I had gone to law school. So I went to Philadelphia, I spent seven years representing people on um, Pennsylvania's death row, and then finally Elaine picked up the, the phone and called and said, okay, now you can come back. <laughs> so that's the story. Wow. Um, <laughs> I didn't know any of this, so I'm sitting up here just like all of you. With my, my, there, I see some mouths open, too. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. So students, did exactly. you hear that? A little bit of moxie goes a did long way. Did you hear that? You could just go volunteer, and it could be your future role. So think about that. I know volunteering doesn't pay money. But, it does not. But it's going to pay you back later. It just, does that. Just know that. Okay, next question. How are we supposed to elect leaders who will promote justice reform when we live in a democracy based on a two-party system? Well, listen, I can solve a lot of problems. I can't solve all of them. This is a problem. I don't have a good answer for this question, right? I mean, we're all gonna have to make hard decisions at this moment, right? I want to tell you all you know, let's create a different party that does the right thing, and I want us not to lose the democracy by doing that, right? I want us not to fall into authoritarian regime, although I'm not taking saying that about any particular candidate because I'm a 501c3 and we don't have any political position about anybody of any kind. So I'm just saying, hypothetically, that would be a concern for me, right, as an individual person. Right, that's what I would wanna do, is say, right, as me, Christina Sorens, I wanna say, everyone here at Bethel College, all of the good, you know, all the people that understand these problems, we should all get together and we should all, right, create a pack and let's force people to do the right thing. That's what I think the answer is. Do I want to do that at the expense of the democracy? I don't think so, right? So these are hard questions, I don't have a good answer. So I think in this moment, we're gonna be, I, 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 speaking personally, not for my organization, right? I am trying to make 
better choices, not the best choices, right? These are not, we don't have the best choices in this moment. I don't, I don't, speaking only for myself, I don't have the best choice, right, in this moment. I am just going to have to choose who I think is better. All right. Next question. What would you say to people who argue that the, bet, that the death penalty deters crime. Yeah, I think there's actually research that proves that's not the case. I think there are studies that show that the jurisdictions with death, you know, high death sentencing rates also have high crime rates. I haven't looked at this in a while, in fairness, but I just don't think it holds, is the truthful answer. Um, you know, so like, for example, you know, New York, for a while, it was trending high in uh, in murders and, and crimes. You know, there's no death penalty there, right? Um, so wait, no, that works opposite. That just I just undid my see. This is what I'm saying. This is my undid my argument. But I am pretty sure that there is there's research. I heard recently research, and it might be about guns and the death penalty. But there is research that shows that the correlation doesn't hold. All right. Next question. The weight of the injustice in our criminal justice system is so heavy. What keeps you fighting? Yeah, I get this question all the time. Um, I think a bunch of things. I think once you, what, when for me, speak, I can only speak for myself, once I saw how terrible the system really is and how just horribly abused people are within it, I found it hard to walk away, right? I am, you know, I have a lot of fight in me, and so I'm driven to the fight. I want to fight against that, right? That is just, it just inspires me to keep fighting the more, you know, injustice I see. I will say that I am strengthened in doing that because the people that I am fighting for invariably are extraordinary. Right, the people I have represented, even those who were not raising claims of innocence, people who admitted to very serious, very violent crimes, even those people I am inspired by. Um, it's um, the way we look at human beings, especially human beings who have committed violent crime, as you look at them as the crime and the privilege that I get is to see them in three dimensions, right? They have committed, many people have done terrible acts and they also have a sense of humor, right? They also really love their mother. They also, you know, have a childhood of terrible trauma. And I am in a unique position to see the fullness of a human being and be reminded, right, that we are all full human beings and we are all, um, you know, all of us fall from grace in one way or another. Um, and so when you see that, when you have the privilege of seeing, right, someone not as a, as a crime, but as a person who is just trying their best under extraordinary circumstances, and truly the people that I represented that did commit terrible crimes came from worlds that are incomprehensible that lived through trauma and violence and horrors beyond my imagination. So I am inspired that they have been able to endure that. I have met their families, that the families are able to endure these things is incomprehensible. So they inspire me every single day. The clients I work with now at the Innocence Project are freed and exonerated clients are very integral to the way we work and the work we do. They're in the office, they're part of development, they're part of, they have, we have an executive um, advisory board of exonerated, freed and exonerated people, and they are amazing. And they have done decades behind the wall, and they were innocent, and they are funny, and they're inspired, and they all talk about sort of the long view, right? You're in prison, you're in a cell, right? But they have their eyes on someplace else. And I'm like, if you can do that behind the wall, I can do that here, right? That's the least I can do with my life, is to see the vision you know, that you could see. So it's a privilege to do that. More functionally, I would say we do have a psychiatrist on staff that works with us on staff. 
that works with us around issues of secondary stress and vicarious trauma. Each department has the ability to bring her in as much or as little as they want. My team, the executive team, meets with her quarterly, right? And that's just a dump of feelings and she gives us strategies, right? To put us all back together and go back out there and keep doing the work and keep inspiring 115 people to not fall apart and to keep going even when it gets hard. So, you know, practically, right, I have a therapist <laughs> that helps us uh, go forward, you know. And so for all of those reasons, that keeps me going, right? It is a privilege. I, I'm, I am deeply privileged, I think, to do the work that I do, to have walked beside the people I have walked beside, clients, colleagues, all of it has been the honor of a lifetime. Those are our questions. Christina Swarns, everybody. Thank you. I want to take some time um, to talk about Kippur. I said to um, some folks earlier this evening that the Peace Lecture Series is our love letter to the Bethel College community. It is the way that we bring you a little of the energy and spirit within um, what rests in our mission and values back to the community. And I feel like tonight, this lecture, this time listening to Christina is exactly, it strikes the right note for what we want to bring back to this community all the time. In addition to that, we have the daily run of KIPCOR. We have a community mediation center where we work with families who are divorcing, separating, or have never been married to develop parenting plans for their children and to mitigate any conflict that keeps them from being the best that they can for their children. So that's, that's one thing we do. We also teach courses at Bethel College. Some of our students are in this room. We also train people in the community and beyond. Um, now that we have become virtual, the, the virtual universe exists, we have been training people from around the country in different types of conflict resolution. Mainly, the largest group of people that we've been having the um, ability to train and the honor and the privilege to train is the educators that work in Kansas public schools throughout the state. We do that through our Restorative Schools Initiative. And there are so many other ways that we show up. We try to show up in community when there's harm that has occurred. We facilitate large events and small ones. And even students, if they have conflict just within their dorms, I'm not getting along with my roommate, we will see students in their conflict all the time. We try to be as available as we can on all fronts because that's what we do. We are a peace building institute. And might I add, in the time that I've been here, we have probably approached our 40th year. I've stopped counting. I've, I've not really quite got that whole. We came in around a 35 year celebration that I think went three years long and I kind of don't know, but I think it's about 40 now. So I say all of that to say, why do you give to an organization that does these things? 
because we do them in the community. We do them in a way that we want to make it affordable for everyone who walks through our doors. In order to do that, we have to have the support of the community. It doesn't happen any other way. And so I ask in this time, um, we are going to pass baskets around. I'm offering you a special treat. Now I'm telling you something. I had a dream about this song that you're about to hear. And I couldn't think who could do this song justice. And I had the epiphany and I knew I had it right. I just was hoping and praying that she would say yes. And so you get to hear one of my favorite songs, Ella's song. It is about Ella, it's the words of Ella Baker put to music by many of you are familiar with the group Sweet Honey and the Rock. Well, we have our taste of Sweet Honey and the Rock right here in Michelle Armster, you know, our own Sweet Honey. <laughs> Michelle Armster, who is the Executive Director of Mennonite Central Committee Central States, who has been, I would say, when I say ride or die, do y'all know what I mean? Michelle's one of my ride or dies. And so I'm so grateful that she said yes and she would do this. So please, without further ado, Michelle Armster and Rob Simon on drums. Thank you. We're gonna, we're gonna take a second to do the tempo. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. It comes until the killing of the black man, black Mother sons is as important as the killing of white men. White mother sons, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. That which touches me most is that I have a chance to work with people. Passing on to others that which was passed on to me. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. To me, the young people come first. They come to have the courage of their faith. And if I can shed some light as they carry us through the gale, we who we believe, believe in freedom cannot rest. rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. You can sing the along. The older I get, the better I know that the secret of my going on is when the reins are hands of the young ones who dare to run against the storm. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Not clutching for power, not needing the light just to shine just on me. I need to be one in the number as we stand against tyranny. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I'm a woman who speaks in a voice and I must be heard. At times I can be such difficult, but I'll not bow to any man's word. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. 
We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I just want to hug you. <laughs> they don't know that I'm going to make them do this, but I am going to. I need my staff to come up, including senior associates. I want you to join me up here. And I'm going to do the thing I shouldn't do and say, Gretchen, could you grab my bag when you come up, please? <laughs> this is the casual part of the program. This is me wanting to offer um, some parting remarks. But before I do that, thank you for my bag, Gretchen. if our slide will show this or not. Okay. We're not quite there. We're, we're past that. Oh, well. Um, uh, that's okay. I want to take some time before I give some closing remarks to say, since I've gotten to KIPP Corps, I have had, um, if, if you think about ghost writers and what they do, and even though someone may get the credit and they get all of this, they are the one that's a public face of a publication there's someone who undergirds their success. And I have had the best person to help undergird my success in Kirsten Zerger. And everybody in this room who knows about Kip Corps knows that. So I have I am not, just in the same way, I am not going to read her bio, but I encourage you to do so because it is quite impressive. But I do want to share some basics. So you have to know, Kirsten is a Bethel grad. She got her BA at Bethel College in 1973. She got her JD at the University of California at Berkeley School of Law in 1977. That's not a shabby school, folks. And you gotta be pretty much a brainy smurf to go there and even get in. So the good thing for Bethel and for this community and for what would become KIPP Corps is that Kirsten and her husband, Sandy Nathan, who was sitting on the front row, decided to make, come back and make Kansas their home and raise their, their children here. And what a great fortune for us, because I believe that part of the beginnings of KIPP Corps are attributed to her doing the work to determine whether KIPP Corps should exist. And thankfully, yes, it should. And Gary Flory was brought here as the first executive director many years ago. Now, I, I know that I could say some things. I, I will say some of the highlights of those years prior to her coming here were that um, she and her husband 
they're like celebrities that walk this area and they don't talk about it. But you've heard of Cesar Chavez? They worked with Cesar Chavez, the United Farm Workers in the 70s. And when I heard that, I'm like, who are these people? And they're right here in Kansas. And they're, again, I, I say that about Christina walking history. I say that about Kirsten as well and Sammy. And she also, um, to, um, in her early years, worked as lead counsel for the, um, the California Teachers Association. And so in that way, she has a lot of the things, a lot of the knowledge that we needed to build the Restorative Schools Initiative was kind of in her DNA. And so, as, as for many years, when she did work for KIPP Corps, she was over education and training. So the courses that we teach and a lot of the, the, the ways that we do the trainings that we do were birthed out of some of the things that she put into it. So when I came here in 2017, she was right here to give me the history, to help me to understand what was important. And when I had my tough days, I could call her up and she would take, she was, she was another person that would take my call. Sometimes I think she <laughs> has taken too many of my calls. Sorry, Sandy. But ultimately, I couldn't do this without her. And so I want to give you your due in a small way. We can never show the appreciation for all that you have done, but I want to have you take this small token of our appreciation. And if you'll come up, please, I want to read this to you. And I want you all to hear this. This says, above and beyond, presented to Kirsten Zerger for your years of dedication to the Kansas Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, KIPP Corps, and for your unwavering support of our mission and goals. Our success rests on your shoulders. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us all as it compels us forward. And I do this with the support of Gary Flory, who is here tonight. And there are people in your family, Kirsten, who are hidden in the room. There are, <laughs> they're like, uh, Sandy was like, well, what if they, we all sat together? She's gonna get suspicious. I said, well, don't sit together. There are people who are on the live stream tonight. I am sure your sons are watching. I know that there are other friends of KIPP Corps who are watching and they are so proud of what you have done for this organization. And so thank you, Kirsten. Don't go, just, just stay there. In closing, I just wanna say I've been blessed. Uh, many of you know that I will be moving out of this role as of um, July um, this year. It has been the, the joy of my career to be here and serve in the capacity as executive director of KIPP Corps. I have been blessed with an amazing staff. Le Leslie, Laurel, Gretchen, 
I could not be here, do this without you every day. I know I said Kirsten undergird, so do you. And we work as a team. And I, I mean, we, we, have, we have been through some things at KIPP Corps. And the good, the good thing is, <laughs> I'm so grateful. We don't take it out on each other. We just live to fight another day. But I love these people. They're people, they're part of my family. So I thank all of them, all of you, for this, this time and this moment, and also just in, in this chapter of my life. I'm so grateful for each of you. Um. <laughs> I want to say thank you to John Gehring, to President John Gehring. Thank you for all that you have done to make tonight a success. And thank you for calling me into the next chapter of my life. Even though I said all of the dumb things that would <laughs> say that I, when John asked me about taking this role, I was like, well, you know what? I'm not coming here to ask you for a job. You know, I'm not coming in here. I, you know I, don't, I didn't have this in my background. I said all the dumb things. But I'm grateful even after doing that and having some time to think about it. I'm grateful to be embracing this next chapter. So thank you. And I thank Bob Milliman, Dr. Bob Milliman. Um, I'm, I'm grateful so much for the ways that you have been, you've spoken positivity into the work that I get to do every day. And I look forward to the ways that we'll be in a more collegial relationship in the next chapter. I want to ask my advisory council members that are present, if you would please stand. If you're on the KIPP Corps Advisory Council, please stand. So this is just a few of, of the folks that are part of our advisory council. And they are people, again, who help me in driving KIPP Corps forward. They are people who work with us and not just give lip service. So I thank each one of you for all the good that you do and for all the ways that you support me and support us as an organization. If you are a part of the planning committee for the Peace Lecture and Justice Symposium, please stand. So these folks have given tirelessly their time over the course of about almost a year we have been planning this. And again, people who not just said they just showed up, but they're, they're working, they worked tirelessly to make this a great event and tomorrow a great event. And so I just want to say a couple of things about tomorrow. We are launching a justice symposium that was the brainchild of Donna, the Donna Neufeld family, but Donna Neufeld. And I don't know if any members of the family are present tonight, but we thank you for this incredible opportunity to do this and for your generous gift in giving the college the funds so that we can do this in the future. And tomorrow is the first symposium. So if you are available, it is going to be a wonderful day, a great, great opportunity to hear more from Christina. We also have others who will be um, part of our panelists, our, our panelists in the morning. Mark McCormick, who we've recognized earlier, will be one of our panelists. There are a couple of others. I'm not sure if, Kelson, if you're here. Um, okay, he may, he may not be here tonight. 
but there are, there are a couple of others. Um, Kelson Bonet and Ricky Kidd will also be here. You will not want to miss Ricky Kidd sharing his story of how he was wrongfully convicted for 23 years. And he's going to share that story with us in the morning. Our students, if, if you're still on the fence about whether or not you'll come, please know you, this will be an opportunity that you will not want to miss. Um, and we are going to feed you. So all of that said, tomorrow promises to be a great day. That information is on the back of your program. And so um, you'll, you'll get to see the, the full agenda. We also, in the afternoon, will have breakout sessions that um, some of our students will be on a panel. We also have a Bethel alum, Julia Huxman Ronnenbaum, who will also be present to give a breakout session on how she gives back civil rights to the uh, people who have been exonerated. And otherwise, we will have um, a lot of other information about how you can get involved around the abolition movement, if that is something you're interested in. Our people from the Kansas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty and um, the ACLU, which Mark is a part of, they will be on hand to help you to understand what you can do. So all of that said, it is going to be a great day. So I want to say, Christina and I did not talk about this, but she shared the words of one of my absolute great heroes. John Lewis. I used to live in Georgia and I used to think, I'll get to meet him. I'll, what, my time will come. I'll get to meet him. And I, I just never got to meet him. So when he passed away in 2020, I was just heartbroken. But he is someone who lived out what the values of what KIPCOR is all about. And he talked about what we need to do when things are not quite what they need to be in this world. We need to be willing to get in good trouble. And I'm, I'm willing to do that um, every day for the students at this college and for this organization and forward for Bethel College. I'm so grateful that all of you took the time to either come in on the live stream or be here with us in person. I thank you. Please continue to be with us this weekend. Please go and have a wonderful night. We will be over here. Um, Christina will meet and greet some of you. Um, she'll sign some of the posters and, and get to chat you up. We have cookies. And please just enjoy this fabulous night. And we will also see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Have a great night.